The UN dropped a report today that um, de dealing with climate change that was uh, startling. Basically, what they said is that uh, folks have been sitting on their ass for so long uh, that uh, we pretty much uh, guaranteed uh, that uh, we're going to have a warmer um, uh, climate. Uh, and this is what they said, irreversible changes, warmer temperatures sooner. Five alarming findings from the UN climate change report uh, it, it dropped today paints a dire picture of where we are, and it really speaks to uh, a lack of uh, leadership, if you will. Uh, Mustafa, uh, let's talk about this here. Uh, and, and folks, again, just like COVID, just like so many other things, been sounding the alarm, and it's largely folks on the right, oh, it's a hoax, it's a hoax, this stuff is false, it's false. And now these scientists are saying we've reached the point of no return. Y'all screwed this up. You didn't do what you're supposed to do over the last 20 years. So guess what? We are here now. Yeah, the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, is made up of the world's top scientists on climate. And the report that came out was talking about the impacts that are going on, the ones that are happening in this moment in the climate crisis and also what is coming in the not-so-distant future. You know, there's a, a number of just mind-blowing things that are currently going on that sometimes people just don't see because you're dealing with so many other types of things. You know, our temperature right now, our global temperature, we haven't seen these levels in 100,000 years. And the amount of CO2 that we currently have in our atmosphere hasn't been seen in over 2 million years. And those are elements that are playing out in the warming up of the planet, of the oceans, and you see these extreme weather events that are going on. When you see places with temperatures of 118 degrees and you see these biblical floods and these, uh, these wildfires that are just devastating millions of acres, all of that is driven by the decisions that humans have made and the actions that we have with our addiction to fossil fuels. So the IPCC is saying you got five options and it's gonna play out. Either we can be all in, we can make sure that we're making the investments that we get the policies in place and then we can limit many of these impacts that are happening, or we can put our heads in the sand, and there will be devastating effects that will happen not only to the environment, but also to our economy. And we know that black and brown and indigenous folks are the ones who are gonna be hit first and worst. We see it play out every time that there's a hurricane, every time there's one of these major floods, and a number of other things. So the IPCC is, once again, saying what frontline communities have been saying for decades now, that everything is accelerating, but we got to get moving right this moment. And that's why the Biden administration has got to be tougher. They've got to make sure that they're expanding and that they're being bold on the actions that are necessary. Um, this, the f five takeaways, uh, Macongo, uh, let's go to my computer. We may reach 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming much sooner than previously expected. We're a decade ahead. Uh, also, the report says human caused climate change is already affecting every region across the globe saying that humans are the reason for the problem. Uh, also, as global temperatures get high, extreme weather will get worse. As Mustafa talked about, uh, we've, we've seen these hurricanes, these floods. Uh, we've seen uh, all of these different uh, things. If temperatures increase by two degrees, a once in every 10 years extreme is likely to occur 5.6 times. Well, that means every other year. Uh, if in each incremental increase in global temperature will lead to lower levels of Arctic sea ice, snow cover, and permafrost. Under all five admission scenarios, the report lays out the Arctic is likely to see at least one September month that is practically free of sea ice before 2050. Then it says many changes to Earth are irreversible for centuries and millennia. Irreversible. Yeah, and I think that in addition to, to everything uh, our brother Mustafa was saying as well when we talk about this, we also have to talk about when we talk globally about the political cost of climate change because people don't talk often about how climate change actually also is part of what can create refugees. I've seen this all across the world and having visited and worked in almost 30 countries. There are, are, are wars and civil conflicts that happen when, when the wells dry up and people don't have access to water, where you gotta get it from somewhere, you're moving over into neighboring communities, they're like, you know, we're not with that. And so conflict ensues. And then when you talk about other resources that are drying up, the ability to not have arable land, right, then people have to move to find that as well. well 
if the populations you go to are not moving. These are the political costs of climate change that people don't understand, which have literally led to violence across the world in the past and is also happening currently. So we talk about the economic issues, we talk about the environmental consequences to our health, but wars will literally be fought over this issue of climate change as well. And so if that's not an additional incentive to start doing something about it now, it's going to be too late, and there's going to be real bloodshed that's going to continue to shed over this issue of climate change. So I just wanted to add that to the conversation as well. And the thing that drives as crazy, uh, Julian, is that uh, the, these folks who, the, the answer, if you want to kill something in America, oh, my God, it's going to cost jobs. It's going to cost too much. It's sort of like for me with COVID. People say, my freedom. You ain't got no freedoms when you're dead. <laughs> And so for the people who are yelling about, oh, this is going to affect jobs, if you got no planet, ain't going to be jobs. And so, like, for instance, here's this idiot, Josh Hawley, out of, of Missouri, complaining about the infrastructure bill because, oh, it has that green stuff in it. Listen to this. Video's frozen. I'm going to sit. Let me tell you, I can do a reset here. I mean, it's just, it's just unbelievable here. Uh, structure at all. Go to it now. It's about woke politics. Why is President Biden so enthusiastically for it? Because it advances his far left agenda. The Green New Deal, elements of it across this bill, the climate change agenda, it's stuffed into this bill, quotas for this, that, and the other in this bill. So this is a bill that is about the woke political agenda of the left. It is being paid for with this massive pork barrel spending. And I just hope Republicans will open their eyes to what's actually in the bill. You know, when you get a bill, this late in the process, this 2,700 plus pages long, sometimes it's tempting not to actually look and see what's in the bill. Folks should look and see what's in this bill. I think it's going to be awfully hard to explain to Republican voters that we have gone along or some Republicans have gone along with this kind of an agenda, this sort of a social agenda, this kind of pork barrel spending. And so I think it's absolutely vital that Republicans take a principled stand and say we're not going to be part of Joe Biden's left-wing agenda. We're not going to advance his woke political agenda. We're going to stand up for the principles that we share and believe in as Americans. We're going to stand up for some basic fiscal responsibility. And for those reasons, we're going to vote no on this bill. And, and of course, there uh, he offered absolutely no specific. Everything was just woke, 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 Green New Deal, woke, 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 woke Green New Deal. But guess what? There are 18 Republicans who did go along uh, with this because they understand it. Um, the thing here, Mustafa, that, again, that, that, you, that people don't you th see. <laughs> huh? Didn't you just call on me and then moved on? No, 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 no. Hold, hold, just hold, hold tight one second. Because uh, the reason, the reason I'm, I need you to hold, hold tight because Mustafa is actually leaving us at 730. And so I need to get his comments before he has to leave us. So I'm coming right back. Just hold on. Mustafa, the thing here that is so troubling is that it's happening in front of us. And how then, though, how do politically do folks make the argument to get voters to realize that this is an issue. I think that's the big deal. How do you get voters to wake up and realize this, this matters and they should be voting based upon climate change? Well, some people are beginning to move because of the impacts that are happening. Farmers, for an example, they see these extreme droughts that are happening. So they are now linking that, of course, to climate change. Many other folks because of being impacted from the wildfires and, and, and some of the other things that are going on. But for others, the president was really smart by actually talking about climate change in the prism of jobs and the millions of new jobs that are a part of the solutions that are going on. Now, Republicans should be lining up to actually make sure that there are more jobs uh, that are available, especially inside of their states, um, because many of the folks who are some of the most uh, ardent uh, detractors from what's going on are ones who, who most desperately need these new sets of jobs uh, and these economic opportunities that are tied to it. So that is also beginning to move folks. The other part, Roland, that I'll share very quickly is that young Republicans are saying that climate change is real, that we need bold action on it. And they are also, even though they don't have a huge influence yet in their party, they are pushing their party to get in alignment with what the world is asking for. So it's not the Democrats asking for this. The world is saying that we have to do this. And if we don't, the price 
will be astronomical. We spent $1.9 trillion over the last 30 years on the impacts of the climate crisis, and that's before it began to rev up. So you can pay now, or you are going to try and pay later. Uh, Mustafa, we certainly appreciate you joining us. Thank you so very much. Thanks a lot. Julian, uh, I'll, I'll, now, I'll now go to you. The, the, that's the real issue. That's the real issue right here. How do we get people to realize politically this is an issue? They should be voting along these lines. Re the, re the Republicans love to demonize, uh, love to demonize the Green New Deal, but it's dealing with the economy. Well, precisely. Mustafa is absolutely right when he says you will pay now or you will pay later. But the issue is we will pay. And we're already paying. We see the paying in terms of these massive floods, in terms of the fires, in terms of all of that. And what needs to happen is that some environmentally situated economists need to cost some of this stuff out. How much does it cost when you lose a whole town in California, a whole town or hundreds of acres of, of basically forced which then means that has another impact on the environment in terms of not having that forest anymore. Some of these things need to be costed out and put in real dollars. That holly is just, uh, somebody just put a sock in it. I mean, what the right has been very, very capable of doing is taking our language and turning it against us. So it's a woke, well, what's wrong with being woke? You want to be asleep? You know, it's a woke agenda. It's a the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal has so many really important aspects to it. Uh, just all of the rhetoric is basically designed to separate people from reality. And what we know, uh, what the UN report said in the language was really quite stunning. And they call it a code red for humanity. That's a term they use, a code red for humanity. And that's where we are. Omokongo's point about migration is really important because the other thing that happens um, is it, it, from an economic perspective and that some countries in the short run are better able to withstand this than others are. When mm -hmm. 2010, I went to the um, COP15, uh, the Climate Tr Change Conference, and there were some brothers there, they're Polynesian brothers, who are from a little island called Tuvalu. They had seen their island literally lose half of its land mass because of increased flooding. And I, don't, I haven't kept up with what happened after that. It may not be there anymore. So then where do those people go? And what happens to them? Some of our developing countries, so the, on the African continent, especially on the coasts, if you see some of that, it's going to affect different countries differentially. Oh, the U.S. could probably stave it off for another 10, 20 years, but there are some countries who are only gonna last five. So this has long-term implications in the term code red for humanity couldn't be more telling. This is an emergency that we seem to not care about. Again, on the Congo, you have to put this in a, a political way for voters to get. And I think that has not been uh, achieved by Democrats. They have not been able to, because again, the argument that always defeats them, it's gonna cost us jobs, it's gonna cost too much money, and this is a capitalistic society. Everything is put in those terms. And I just think that people just got to say, y'all keep playing with this here, you're going to be dead. Your kids are going to be dead. And then, and then I think they got to challenge evangelicals. They got to go white evangelicals. How can y'all talk about uh, the Bible said, take care uh, of what, be good stewards of what God gave you, and y'all don't give a damn about the planet? You got to go there. I mean, I, I, just think, I just think Democrats have to have to communicate in a different way. Right now, it's too, it's perceived as being too flowery, too flower child-like, hippie-like. No, you gotta cut right to the, the, the heart of it to get somebody uh, uh, in, in their face and say, hey, it's affecting you right now. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think that our current leadership, you know, the Democrats have the ability to do that. I don't think that they have the ability to really drive it home like that. And living in a society where we've literally lost the ability to focus on the common good, maybe we never had that idea. Maybe it's just a ro romanticized notion, but people are so in it for themselves that quite honestly, I feel like 
these Democratic leaders can probably do a better job of driving home these economic consequences and maybe making the messaging better around that. Look, we talk about climate change, we talk about COVID. I believe that there are many people who are starting to get the vaccine because they're seeing the death straight up in front of them more. But I think the majority of people are starting to get it because it's going to hurt them economically when they can't fly, when they can't go back to their jobs, government mandates, corporations are mandating it that they're working for. And now they're like, I got to have this job. And so I'm going to do that. We And I think with climate change, it has to be the, the, the same way. They're, you know, convincing people in the coal mining world that going with, you know, working with solar panels and all that other type of stuff economically makes more sense. Because whenever people talk about these political consequences rolling there, we're so polarized right now that they're just not going to get it. But as Joe Madison says, hit people in their pocketbooks and their hearts would follow. Democrats got to be better at that message now, too, to get more people on board, because they can't drive the message home. They're not capable of doing it. Maybe the younger guys, the Cory Bushes of the world, the AOCs, the Omars of the world, could hit that message on a more personal level. But the current leaders at the top, they just don't seem to be able to do that. It's time to be smart. When we control our institutions, we win. We win. This is the most important news show on television of any racial background. Y'all put two, three, four, five, 10, 15, 20, 30 dollars on this and keep this going. What you've done, Roland, since this crisis came out in full bloom. Anybody watching this, tell your friends, go back and look at the last two weeks, especially of Roland Martin Unfiltered. I mean, hell, go back and look at the last two days. You've had sitting United States senators today, Klobuchar and Harris. Whatever you have that you have, you can bring to Roland Martin Unfiltered to support it. Please do, because this information may literally save your life. Watch Roland Martin Unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com.